Howdy partners and welcome to our weekly animal hero story. Because it was Memorial Day this Monday and last week was Armed Forces Day, I'm going to be telling one more animal story about World War II. This week, however, it's not a dog, although I just love Stubby and all the adventures he had. He was amazing. This week, it's a farm animal. I'm going to let you see if you can guess what it is. <laughs> no, it's not Ryder. It's a chicken. <laughs> in fact, in particular, it's a hen. And the title of this story is Little Hen faithful. She was a little chicken that lived in France and the war was going on at that time. A French soldier was injured, was wounded badly in the war and he fell into a ditch in the battlefield while the war was going around him and the bombs were going off but he was safe inside the ditch although he could not move and he had no food he had no water and day by day he got weaker from lack of those things finally one day he was so desperate he decided that he would do what he had seen some of his fellow soldiers do he decided to pray to god and he said, dear God, if you're there, if you can hear me, please answer my prayer that someone will come and save me. And if you do that, I promise that I will, after the war, find a church and I will attend there and become a member. Well, it wasn't long after that when he fell asleep in the ditch and woke up to a scratching sound. And as he looked, right above him was a little hen laying one egg, right within his reach. But he waited until the hen had gone. Because she was a free-range chicken, she wandered around that battlefield. And when he could, he reached for that egg, and you guessed it, he ate it. He was starving. And he hoped that this was the answer to his prayer, and it was because five days in a row, that little chicken came back and laid one egg just close enough for the French soldier to reach it. And before long, he was found in the ditch by people uh, that were friends, friendly people, who took him to the army hospital where he was healed. And then, when he was discharged from the hospital, he didn't forget his promise to God. He found a church, he became a member there, he was baptized and served the Lord from then on. And he never forgot Little Hen Faithful because she worked all things together for good to the, for the French soldier. I hope you like that story. Oh, hi, Larry. What can I do for you? Is Harry at home? No, he went to Durango, Colorado for a few weeks to work at a ranch belonging to an uncle of his friend. Wow, that sounds cool. I wish I was cool. The kids in the neighborhood just call me names. What name do they call you? They call me Chicken because I wouldn't throw rocks at the neighbor's dog when they were... They also said I was a big chicken. I... I wouldn't do a prank call to the teacher. So they're calling you a chicken because you wouldn't do what they told you to do? All the time. So who do you think is braver? Someone who does what the bullies tell them or someone who stands up against what the bullies say? I never thought of it that way. I just decided the next time they call me chicken, I would call them something meaner. My grandma always says that when you return evil for evil, then there are two evils instead of one. In other words, you become like the person that is mean to you instead of helping them become more like Christ. So, so that, what should I do then? Punch them in the nose? <laughs> no, that would be a bad idea. And I think you know that. You could tell them the story of Little Hen Faithful and say that even brave chickens can be heroes too. But the best thing to do is to tell them what Christ has said and done in the face of name calling and bullying. Like one.
Those neighborhood kids remind me of Satan when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness by trying to bully them into doing what Satan told him. What did Jesus do? Well, the first time when Satan told him, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Jesus quoted from the Old Testament saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I remember now, in the other two temptations, he also answered Satan, the bully, with Bible verse verses. What Bible verse could I use when my bullies say, if you're a Christian, how come you can't fight bullies like David when he fought Goliath? You could quote from the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And why don't you read Matthew 5, 11, and 12 right now? Blessed are you when the people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say kind, kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now how do you feel? Like a very brave chicken. Hi everyone. Happy Sabbath. God bless you all. church and I will make the gates of Hades um. <laughs> and it will not overcome it well hello Santa Cruz I will tell you I remember last year when I was with you uh, that I did say I was gonna come back to visit with you again this year 
Of course, when I said that, I did not have this in mind, and I'm sure neither did you. Things are quite different and, and to a large degree quite challenging for us right now, aren't they? And you know what's interesting about what we're currently dealing with with this whole COVID-19 thing is that to a large extent and for the church, this has really uh, pushed us out of our comfort zones. Um, and I'll probably chat a little bit about that here in a little bit as I share my message, Reimagining Church. A um, few things have changed for uh, myself and my family and our dynamics since the last time I was with you. And it's actually quite interesting here at the beginning of the year, um, I was actually invited to come and pastor in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and I did accept that opportunity. And literally, we were moving right, we actually moved here um, about three weeks ago now, so four weeks ago, I believe, right in the heart of everything that's going on. And so this is definitely, I wouldn't recommend anyone move during times like this, but it's quite different. It's quite challenging to say the least. Um, and as I was saying, the church is to a large extent uh, shifted and, and had to move out of its comfort zone as well as the rest of the world. And so with that in mind, you know, this idea and this thought, you know, I've been for myself pondering and thinking a lot about, you know, church and, and what it really means and what it's really all about. And so thus the title Reimagining Church. I actually think that right now, uh, we have a great opportunity in reality to, to think a little different and to look at how we do things and see how can we actually uh, be better. I mean, when you think about it, to a large extent, what we're currently dealing with right now is a bit of an inconvenience if we're honest with ourselves, right? I know for myself, literally uh, trying to move my family, my three-year-old daughter and my wife, in the middle of what's going on, there were a lot of inconveniences, a lot of different challenges uh, to work through. You know, how am I going to find housing, all these things. But also for the church, like our comfort zone, where, where we're normally used to being, the place where we're used to being at, it's, it's, we're not there anymore. And our, our sense that we have developed for such a long time of just like comfort and what we're used to, it has been shifted. It has been moved. And so, yeah, to a large degree and to a, a large extent, um, this situation is challenging and it, it feels like a bit of an inconvenience. But the truth of the matter is, as we think about church and what it means and what we're supposed to be doing, I actually think that this situation gives us a little bit of an opportunity to step back for a moment and reevaluate everything as we're no longer doing most of what we normally would do. This is a great time to reevaluate everything. And so that to me is very important for us right now. But even before COVID-19, even before this took place, the truth of the matter is the church was actually dealing with some challenging dynamics that it really needed to evaluate and look at. I mean, take for example, so you, you, we were dealing with the fact that you know, the church can do a reasonable and sometimes a decent job of bringing individuals into the front door. But for some reason, we also had a retention problem where we would be losing them through the back door. And so that was a challenge that the church was dealing with well before this. Also, you look at the early 1900s with our, our church, our church context, and our growth rate in North America was somewhere around 10%. And here now it's 2% or a little under 2% before COVID-19. And also you're looking at the dynamics of how well is the church reaching and connecting with uh, the next generation, with the younger population, with, with millennials and, and those that come after the millennials and all of that. And we realized that we were struggling in those areas. So right now, as we're out of our comfort zones, as we're largely inconvenienced, what better time than now to reimagine church? And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And the, very, the, the, the main question I want to answer in my message for you today is simply, as we're thinking and reimagining church, we have to ask the basic fundamental question of what is church? Like, what is the church? We, we use the term, we use it quite loosely in reality, and it's, it's in the Bible, but what does it actually mean? And chances are what I'm going to share with you, you know, you know, intrinsically, and you're familiar with it. But the truth of the matter is, 
Um, I think while we might know it, we, I, we, we struggle to a certain degree to like actually embrace it and live it out in a practical manner. So what exactly is church? That's what I want to evaluate uh, with you. And for that, I want us to actually look in the New Testament. We're going to look in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to actually look at the very first mention of the word church in Scripture. Um, and it's an actually quite interesting word. And as we look at it, we will actually see uh, what it actually means, and that will define for us and help us basically begin the process of reimagining church. So Matthew chapter 16, uh, we're going to begin at verse number 13. I'm going to share with you beginning at verse number 13. Matthew 16, 13. Here in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has just had an un another one of his unfortunate encounters with the religious leaders, with the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And, and as he has that encounter, he then leaves that situation with them and he goes and he has a conversation with his disciples. And following that conversation with his disciples, he, he asked them a bit of a probing, a bit of a testing question to just kind of evaluate. He's been with them now for some three years and, and now he just wants to simply evaluate where their thinking is, what, where they're at. And here's the question that Jesus asked them, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So the first question he actually asked two. The first question that Jesus asked, he's asking his 12 disciples now. He says, who are people around? As you're, as you're going around and you're, 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 you're connecting with different individuals, you're having conversations, it's clear that I'm the talk of the time. Who are they saying that I am? Who do they perceive that I, the Son of Man, am? So that's the first question that Jesus asked. What are people saying? What, what's their perception? What's their perspective? What are they thinking as far as who I am? What is the thinking? And then the disciples decide to respond in verse 14. So they said, some say John the Baptist. Well, I mean, that's interesting. Some say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So there was no real conclusion from the people. Individuals were just enamored with and very impressed with what they saw in Jesus. And, you know, they're wondering, is this John the Baptist? Is he, is he reincarnated? Has he been resurrected? Is this Elijah? Did Elijah come back from the dead? Like, you know, the scripture does promise that Elijah is going to come back. You know, is this one of the prophets, Jeremiah? Who is So there's really no consensus amongst the masses, amongst the multitude of exactly who Jesus is. And so that's the first question. Jesus asks his disciples, who are, who are people saying that I am? And, 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 and the disciples share the different responses based on what they have been hearing as they've been interacting with the people. But then Jesus continues um, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, this is where he really starts now to get into a little bit more of the heart of his purpose and the heart of the matter. You see, the masses and the multitude, they were, they were familiar with Jesus. They, they got to spend some time with Jesus, but not necessarily to a large extent at a very close and personal level. And so with their interactions a little bit more from a distance, not as close, not as personal, they, they, they see him healing individuals, they see him feeding people, and they see a lot of things... Um, but they don't have the close encounter and the close interactions that the disciples actually have. So he starts with, okay, so who are the masses saying that I am? They give the response. He's like, but who do you say that I am based on your interactions with me? We get to spend time together, me, you, me and the, me and you just the, the 13 of us, and, and you, you get a little bit more of an intimate picture. You get a little bit more of a closer perspective than the multitudes are getting. So based on your interactions, based on your experience, who do you say that I am? And the response comes from none other than Peter, the disciple who was usually the quickest to respond, one of the first to speak. Um, oftentimes he would put his foot in his mouth, but on this particular occasion he actually um, gives a very correct answer. And it says, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
You see, for Peter, Peter has now spent three years with Jesus. Peter has, has experienced, he's seen very close up the way Jesus interacts and deals with people. Peter has seen that there is something markedly, drastically different about Jesus than any other person he has actually encountered, any other person he has actually heard about. You know, sure, Peter has heard the stories about Elijah. Peter has heard stories about Jeremiah. Peter has heard stories about the other prophets. And he's heard about John the Baptist, maybe even had some personal interactions with John the Baptist. But even there, Peter spending quality personal time with Jesus based on what he has seen in him, the relationship that he has built in him, that he has built with him, Peter is like, there's something unique. There's something different about you, Jesus. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Peter seen something unique, special that led him to the conclusion, led him to the place that, that Jesus was not just a regular person. Jesus wasn't just a good person. Jesus had to be the son of God. That's the conclusion that Peter comes to. And Jesus affirms that Peter is correct in that assessment. So Jesus answered in verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so Jesus affirms here as Peter speaks up, and he speaks up quite boldly, quite clearly. Jesus affirms that, you know what? This hasn't just been revealed to you. You have actually been in tune with my Father. You've been in tune with the very heart of God for this to be revealed to you. Yes, you have spoken correctly. I indeed am the Son of God. And then the next verse is actually the place that I really want to focus my attention on, particularly as we're as I'm thinking and as we're talking about the subject matter of reimagining church. Um, verse number 18 is quite significant as Jesus continues his thought. First thing he says is, my father has revealed this to you, Peter. Yes, you are correct. I am the son of God. I am the son of the living God. And here's what I have to share with you and my disciples right now and also my disciples to come. And he says, and I also say, and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church. What exactly is Jesus saying here? Before I actually spend time focusing on, on the word church that Jesus mentions, that Jesus mentions, the first thing that he highlights, the first thing that he states is that on this rock, he says, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, unfortunately, there's sometimes a little bit of controversy, a little bit of conflict as to what this first part of the verse actually means. Who exactly is Jesus building his church on? And there are there's a facet of Christianity that will that will say, um, well, he's building the church on on Peter. But the truth of the matter is, um, I'm not sure that I want to go to that particular conclusion. Nor that would that conclusion actually be be a, 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 an ultimate fulfillment of what Jesus is saying. What my understanding is, and from based on the text, that is Jesus is giving this response on this rock, and based off of other scriptural evidence as well, that he's referring to what Peter had actually just mentioned, that Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus is saying, yes, that's correct. I am the Christ, the son of the living God. And on this rock, meaning on what you just said, on the fact that I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am the Savior of the world, the one that is supposed to come and deliver humanity, save humanity from their sins, save humanity from their sins. That is me. The foundation of the church is not built on any human being. And I think that is actually one of the most important things that we can actually embrace. The foundation of the church is not a mere mortal. The foundation of the church is not a man, it's not a person, just a regular person. The foundation of the church is Jesus, is God in the flesh, Jesus and him crucified. Now, I still love reading to this day, uh, as you're very familiar with Santa Cruz. And a book I read not too long ago, um, a little bit ago, a couple years ago actually, uh, entitled Deep and Wide by Andy Stanley, uh, he, speaking on this particular passage, 
he comments on this first part of the verse, and I absolutely resonate with what he says and totally agree with what he says. He says, the cornerstone or foundation for this new entity called the church, what exactly is the church? We'll talk about that here in a moment. The cornerstone or foundation for this new entity called the church would be the belief that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And then also this statement from the desire of ages, the truth which Peter had confessed is the foundation of the believer's faith. My faith, as well as I am sure your faith, is not built on any human being. Our faith is built on Jesus, his righteousness, his love, the fact that he was crucified, he gave his life for us. That's where our faith, that's where our hope rests. That's where our hope lies. The beautiful reality that Jesus is the son of God and only God, the form of Jesus could save humanity. That's where my faith lies. That's where our faith as followers of Jesus must lie because it shifts and it takes attention off of man, off of humanity, and it brings it to the divine. It brings our attention and our focus to God. It brings our attention and our focus to Jesus, the clearest evidence, clearest picture of unfailing love. Jesus is the foundation of the church. So I want to read that verse or that part of the verse again. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will build my church. First time this word church is used in scripture at all is right here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It's the first time that it is mentioned. Jesus shares this word. He says, I'm going to build, I'm creating something, I'm, I'm doing something different, I'm doing something new, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning a whole new a, a whole new covenant, of course, we know that there's a new covenant. I'm beginning a whole new system. I'm, I'm, I'm starting things I'm starting things over. I'm, I'm, I'm rethinking things as it pertains to you, my followers. I'm building this thing called the church. What exactly is the church? Well, the first time it's mentioned in the New Testament, so now we have to kind of figure out what exactly does that word even mean? And the word that's used there, the Greek word that's used there is ekklesia. And it's basically a combination of two Greek words. And ek, which means out, and kaleo, which means to call. So the literal meaning of the word means to call out. Now, for a clearer insight as to, you know, what, what Jesus is actually communicating and the impact of what he's communicating um, would be based off of the fact that you look at how the word was used before Jesus used it and in the particular time and context that Jesus was living, the ecclesia basically referred to a, a group or a, a, an, an assembly. As a matter of fact, the Young's literal translation um, renders that part of the verse this way. Upon this rock, I will build my assembly. So it refers to an assembly. It refers to, to a group of people or a gathering of people. Now, what's actually quite interesting about this word, ecclesia, is ways it was used, and, and at the time before Jesus uses it here, it's not a it's not a religious term per se. Um, it's just a term that refers to different gatherings, sometimes civic gatherings and things like that. And so it refers to a group of individuals, a group of people that were gathered together. Now, one of the most important highlights about the way that ecclesia was used especially in the time that Jesus was referring, was Ecclesia never referred to a specific place. But it only referred to gatherings or the groups of or the, the group of people that are gathered together. You see, Ecclesia, or the word that we have for today that's church, does not refer to a place. Now, why is this significant to me? Why am I sharing this with you? Because it's important for us to realize that church is not a place. Church is not a place, it's a face. Church is not a space, 
It's, it's a face. It's, it's a group of individuals. It's a community of people. Wherever the people are, that's where the church is. As a matter of fact, we can just look at another example in Scripture of how it is utilized. Paul utilizes this word in Romans chapter 16. Romans 16 and we're going to look at verses 3 to 5 and it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. And then he says this in verse 5, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. The church that is where? The church that is in their house. The church that is in their house. So on this particular occasion, and as a matter of fact, you look at the life of Paul and, and the way that he started churches. Church, Paul was the first and the best and the greatest <coughs> and the greatest church planter. And what Paul would do is he would go into a particular area for a season and for a time, and he would he would raise up churches, communities of believers, and they were always primarily house churches. The place where they gathered, where they got together and they worshiped was primarily in homes, in houses. You see, Peter or Paul didn't go around and start churches and basically erect massive buildings <clears throat> but he would go and he would help lead people individuals to Jesus help them to realize that they could rest their faith their hope on none other than Jesus and the reason for that is as I have been saying and as I've said already is because Church refers not to a place, not to a somewhere, but to a someone, not just to a location, but to the people. And right now we have, yes, we have been moved. We have been pushed out of our comfort zone. Most of us aren't in our buildings, the places that we turn, usually term the church. But in reality, from a biblical standpoint, that is not the church. And as we're out of that we're actually getting an opportunity to step back for a moment and to evaluate and to reevaluate what is this church thing all about anyway? And the truth of the matter is it's about the people. Now, this is significant and it's significant to me for primarily one reason. What is that reason? I want to take you to the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. And there we see Jesus giving his mission to his believers, to his followers, to the church, right? And as Jesus gives his mission, he reinforces this reality that I'm sharing with you. Something that to a large extent, I think we have lost sight of. You see, the building can be utilized and is effectively utilized as a tool to accomplish the mission of Jesus. But the building is not the church. The building is not the ecclesia. You are the ecclesia. You, as you gather together, whether you're doing it right now, online, via YouTube, or whatever platform digitally you're using, you comprise, you make up the church regardless of location. And here we see Jesus gives his mission to his church. And notice what he says. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus looks at his disciples, he looks at his followers, and he says to them, go. Buildings don't move, but people do. Buildings can't create a movement. Buildings can be a tool utilized by a movement, but buildings can't be the movement because buildings don't move. Jesus looks at his followers, the people, the church, and he says to them, go, go and make disciples. Buildings don't make disciples. People make disciples by the power of Jesus and his spirit. And you see, 
The fact that we are moved right now out of our comfort zones, and interestingly enough, we're, we're moved into situations where even as you know, we start getting to the place where we can gather, they're starting to gather us in smaller numbers. And the fact of the matter is, the mission of the church is to make disciples. People make disciples. People go. People move, not buildings. And the fact that we're called to make disciples, I want to tell you this, that's very important. Discipleship happens in the context, always happens in the context of relationships. And discipleship is best accomplished in the context of smaller settings. What do I mean by that? Well, just look at the evidence of scripture. You know that in Jesus' day, you know that Jesus had three different groups of disciples. You, you see the number, you see, you see a reference a couple of times in the Gospels to the 70, right? You know, he had the 70, but we don't see them mentioned that often. We know they're there, we see them mentioned, but they're not mentioned that often. But then, you know that the, he had the 12, and the 12 gets a little bit more, you see a lot more attention in Scripture. You constantly see him talking about the disciples, the 12, the, the individuals that are closest to him. But even from there, he also has the three, Peter, James, and John, the ones that he actually spends his most close and intimate time with. Discipleship, if it's going to happen and if it's going to be effective, which I believe now is the time for us to get back to discipleship, discipleship happens best in the context of smaller relational circles. And so if the mission that Jesus gave to his church, gave to his followers, was to go and make more disciples, then the shift that has to take place for us is to focus on disciple making, is we have to get to the place where we don't just focus so much of our time, our energy, and our attention on the large gathering. Now, the large gathering is good for the purposes of bringing those disciples together to celebrate the goodness of God. But the truth of the matter is, in that large gathering is not the place where the most effective form of discipleship happens. I mean, just think of the question that Jesus, the questions that Jesus asked his disciples as we began in our sermon today. He says, who do men say that I am? And those, the multitudes, the individuals that have not spent as much quality time with Jesus, they say, John the Baptist. They say, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, you know, somebody else. But the disciples, as they have spent more close time, more intimate time with Jesus, a deeper role, they have a deeper relational connection with Jesus. They're like, Peter is like, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. That's because of the time and the focus and, and the energy that, that Jesus was able to spend with them while they could experience that. And it's the same. The moment you get into a larger setting, the ability to be impacted and the ability to be impactful is a bit lessened, but you start getting into smaller circles, it's a little harder to hide off in a, in a corner somewhere and just keep silent. You have to start kind of building relationships a bit. Discipleship is the primary purpose of the church, the primary mission that Jesus has given us. And discipleship is why the church exists. Discipleship reminds us that the church it's not a place. It's not a space. It's your face. It's you. It's me. It's the community. It's a group of people. And those people are supposed to go or are, are supposed to move and create a movement of making and multiplying more disciples. So one of the keys and, and the first thing about reimagining church is we have to get back to our original calling of discipleship. And in order to get back to our original calling of discipleship, we have to remember exactly what we are. The church is not the place. The church is not the building. The church is you and me. The church is a community of people called by Jesus to go and be a movement and make disciples. In order for that to happen, we have to shift. We have to shift from just prioritizing the building and the space. We might feel a little inconvenience when we can't go to the church. The truth of the matter is, you are the church. Wherever you go, the church goes. 
whatever interactions you have, you have an opportunity to begin the process of discipleship. Because you can go. The building can't. And so, yeah, the building has a place to be utilized as a tool, but the building is not the church. You're the church. And Jesus has a mission for you, not just for pastors, not just for the leaders of the community, but for all of you. Disciples are supposed to make disciples that make more disciples that make more disciples. Buildings don't make disciples. The key to reimagining church is getting back. We're not reimagining something that's totally brand new. We're actually going back to the place that the church was supposed to be. And it starts with prioritizing and focusing on the people. Wherever the people go, the mission goes. Wherever the people go, the church goes. We reimagine church. Because the truth of the matter is, we are the church. And as we embrace that, and as we move away from prioritizing and overpricing a building and a space, we start prioritizing and prizing people and building relationships and focusing on relational discipleship, then the church can truly be impactful. So during this particular time in the midst of the challenges that we are currently going through, in the midst of the inconvenience that we are dealing with, let's step back for a moment and say, how can we be better after this? As, as, as we can get to the place where we're getting in smaller gatherings, gatherings of 10, you know what? That is a perfect context for discipleship. And if we prioritize discipleship, the church can be much better in the long run missionally because of it. If we can do that, we can get to the place where no longer will we be stagnant as a movement. But we can actually be, be, be vibrant, be progressive, move, and accomplish the mission of Jesus. Because the mission of Jesus is for you, the church to go and make disciples. Since you, as a part of the church, are a disciple of Jesus, you are called by Jesus to go and make more disciples. Reimagine church. Instead of looking at COVID-19 as an inconvenience, which I have at times done that, the truth of the matter is this might be one of our best opportunities yet to get back to the basics and the fundamentals of what this whole church thing is supposed to be all about. And it's supposed to be about Jesus and relational discipleship. My prayer for you, Santa Cruz, my prayer for myself in the context I'm working in right now is that we can reimagine church and we can be better on the other side of this. There's not gonna be a, a normal like we know it. So why don't we start shaping the narrative of what that new normal is gonna look like? And in order to do that, why don't we reimagine church? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the call you have given us, the call to go, the call to make disciples. Thank you for the fact that we are the church. And even though we might not be in our spaces, we might not be in our buildings, we are still the church. And we can accomplish your mission, even with the ch different challenges that may come about because we can still connect with people. Right now it's digital, and a little bit here it will be in smaller relational context, and that sets the stage for the best form of discipleship. Help us to that end. Make us better through this situation is our prayer. In Jesus' name.